So we all, we've all heard about high blood sugar being dangerous, but did you know fat itself can become toxic? I'm talking about lipotoxicity. And that's when fat ends up where it doesn't belong, damaging your liver, your pancreas, your, your muscles, even your heart. Most people have never heard about lipotoxicity, but it could be the hidden driver behind metabolic syndrome, fatty liver, diabetes, and heart disease. So today I'm going to explain what it is, how it shows up, and most importantly, what you can do about it. So what is lipotoxicity? Well, it happens when fat is stored in the wrong places. So fat should be stored in your adipose tissue. And that's the medical term for your fat cells. But when those cells can't hold anymore, the fat begins to spill over into the organs. It shows up as fatty liver, beta cell dysfunction in your pancreas, and insulin resistance in your muscle, and even fatty infiltrations of the heart muscle. So here's an analogy to sort of put it in perspective for you. Think of your fat cells as a closet. And when your closet gets full of extra clothes, um, they don't disappear, right? They either end up on the bed or on the floor or in the laundry basket over in the laundry room, right? That's lipotoxicity. So let's first talk about how it develops. It's pretty simple. It's from chronic energy surplus, from too many carbs, especially from refined carbs and processed fats. Then you get adipose tissue dysfunction. The fat cells become insulin resistant and they are not able to store fat safely anymore. So what ends up happening then is you get spillover. Like imagine if you're pouring a glass of water and you're not paying attention and then you fill the glass up and it's getting full and it starts to uh, spill over the edges. That's what happens. The fat deposits then in the liver, the pancreas, muscle, and heart goes out into the circulation and then invades those organs. And when that happens, you get chronic inflammation, which amplifies all the damage. So here's a term that we're um, very familiar with in the physical therapy world, um, but it applies with all of human physiology, the fat cell story, hypertrophy versus hyperplasia. Now, not all fat cells behave the same. Some people's fat cells mainly grow bigger. That's called hypertrophy. So I'm going to give you a PT example. If you're lifting weights, doing bicep curls, and you're lifting heavy weights, you're going to grow your biceps. And muscle grows through hypertrophy. So if you look at this picture, each cell gets larger. You don't get, you have the same amount of cells you did when you didn't have a big muscle. But when you add resistance, those cells grow. Others can make new fat cells. That's called hyperplasia. With hypertrophy, fat cells max out and they stop storing safely. And that overflow goes into the organs. That itself is the lipotoxicity. These people may look only mildly overweight, but they have severe metabolic disease. Now with hyperplasia, the body creates more fat cells. People become visibly obese, but fat is still stored in the adipose tissue rather than spilling into the other organs. Because under hyperplasia, our fat cells get so big and extended, that's when they start leaking. But if your body had the ability to create, okay, they're full, make some more fat cells, then you can keep getting bigger and bigger and bigger and you have more because you have more and more fat cells to store the extra fat so they become visibly obese but they often are metabolically healthier that's why you see on some of the tv shows i don't remember the names of them through my 300 pound life or whatever 600 pounds they don't have diabetes, but they can continue to gain weight. Whereas I, at 25, 28 years old, 
when I was first pregnant, I was even thinner than I am right now, but I already had fatty liver showing up when they did ultrasounds up for my pregnancy. So ethnicities and genetics definitely play a role. People from South and Southeast Asia, for example, tend to store more fat through hypertrophy and that creates more lipotoxicity. But here's the catch. It happens at lower uh, body mass indexes. So when they're not really overweight, this explains why some people are obese, but metabolically healthy while others appear normal weight, but they're already diabetic. So let's talk about our personal fat thresholds. That's your unique limit. Each of us has a personal fat threshold, a point where our fat cells can, can't safely store any more energy. And once that threshold is exceeded, the fat starts spilling into the liver, the pancreas, and the muscles, and lipotoxicity begins. People with a low threshold may develop type 2 diabetes, fatty liver, or high blood pressure, even at a normal BMI. People with higher thresholds can gain more weight before they cross into metabolic disease. It's about whether you've passed your body's storage limit. So let's talk about prevalence. So lipotoxicity isn't on a lab report, but the fingerprints are everywhere. So let's start with one in three U.S. adults have fatty liver disease. One manifestation, 35 to 40 percent adults show insulin resistance. Another manifestation, tens and millions are affected worldwide, often silently. Let's talk about lipotoxicity versus metabolic syndrome. Now, metabolic syndrome is a diagnosis characterized by high blood pressure, high triglycerides, low HDL, high glucose, and a large waistline. So lipotoxicity equals the root cause. That extra fat spilling into places where it doesn't belong is what's driving those numbers. So who's at risk? Okay, we said South, Southeast Asians. They have higher insulin resistance and fatty liver at lower BMIs, and they're called uh, TOFIs, thin on the outside, fat on the inside. And then you have the Hispanic population has a higher prevalence of NAFLD or non-alcoholic fatty liver disease. And then you have postmenopausal women. After we, our estrogen, estrogen levels come down, we get the hormonal shifts that drive fat storage to the belly. Of course, if you have a family history of diabetes, fatty liver, and heart disease, you may be more prone to it. And there are certain genetics, certain variants like PNPLA3 increase, uh, will increase your susceptibility. So what are your signs and symptoms? Fatigue and carb crashes. I suffered from them for so many years and I really didn't understand it when I was younger, what was going on. And then the next thing you know is that you get central obesity, belly fat at the belly fat, even at a normal weight. You get elevated triglycerides with low HDLs. We've all heard of that. There's a lot of people out there that we know that have that concern. And then you'll get elevated ALT, AST, suggesting fatty liver. You'll also get a creeping A1C or prediabetes. And a real telltale sign is if you have high blood pressure without obvious obesity. Now, some advanced signs of lipotoxicity is if you have NAFLD and NASH, that's uh, non-alcoholic steato uh, hepatitis, if you have arrhythmias or cardiomyopathy. And remember, if the uh, body is laying down that extra fat and you're getting uh, the deposit in the heart muscle, the heart muscle can't work as efficiently, and so it starts to uh, lose function and you start going into signs of congestive heart failure. So let's talk about the clinical presentation. And remember, when I say clinical presentation, I'm talking about the things we can objectively see or measure, So, and that includes labs. So you're going to have fast, you're going to check fasting insulin, triglycerides, HDL, A1C, 
and liver enzymes. They will help paint the picture of if you have lipotoxicity. You could use imaging for, to look for fatty liver on ultrasound or an MRI. You can just look at the clinical presentation, the person in the room, look at them physically. If they have the apple-shaped obesity, they are more risk for metabolic disease. So why do some people struggle on keto while others thrive? This is particularly um, interesting to me. Even though I had uh, lipotoxicity, I still thrived on keto. But if you look back in some of my earlier videos, it took me a good six weeks before I, I lost water weight pretty quickly, but it really took me six weeks to get in the groove. And so I think I had a fair amount of lipotoxicity for sure. So what does it look like if you have lipotoxicity and you start keto? Well, you may not adapt as easily to keto. You may have fatigue, poor results, stalled weight loss. So here's an analogy to kind of visualize it. Here's a picture of a sink that's overflowing. And if the sink is half full, pulling the plug, which is keto, drains easily. But if it's overflowing, the water is already over all over the floor, meaning that it's in the you have ectopic fat. It's in places there where it doesn't belong. And it takes a lot longer to clean up that fat where it's not supposed to be, just like the, all the water on the floor. So other reasons people may fail keto are because of electrolyte imbalances, under eating protein. They may have th thyroid or adrenal issues. They may still be getting some hidden carbs or some seed oils. Now let's talk about what to do if you have lipotoxicity, a nuanced approach. And remember, you're going to have a harder time starting keto. You're also, you may see now we know our cholesterol goes up and our LDLs, but you may see insulin, uh, fasting, insulin go up, things that triglycerides go up, which is not normal for keto. Mostly all those things improve. So getting your labs before you start. And then, um, I would say after, uh, six weeks or, uh, two months is important to see how you're responding, especially if you're not losing weight. If you're not losing weight, then I would take a look at it a little bit sooner for after a month, I would say. But this is where the nuance matters. Old school keto told us to eat 70 to 80% fat. But if your body is already overflowing with stored fat, adding more won't fix the problem. Here's a better strategy. Prioritize protein. Muscle is your body's main glucose and fat disposal site. So protect it and build more. Use quality fats, but don't overdo them. Butter, olive oil, avocado, tallow, all of those are good. But make fat the complement, not the star. Cut the carbs to lower insulin. So we're maintaining muscle mass by increasing the protein, hitting, keeping us satiated, and then we're cutting the carbs and we want to reduce insulin resistance. We're taking enough healthy fats in to get our fat soluble vitamins. And then the rest is going to come out of the, it actually comes out of the viscera first. It's going to come out of the liver. It's going to start coming out of your muscles. And we certainly want it to come out of your pancreas and your heart. Add intermittent fasting. That's extra time in a low insulin state. And that helps to burn stored fat. Build muscle with resistance training. So you need the stimulus from the resistance training, but you also need enough protein and leucine to build those muscles back up and repair. So when we, when we build those muscles with resistance training, we restore metabolic flexibility. So if this seems overwhelming to you, get guidance. A coach can help tailor your macros fasting and lifestyle changes so you don't get stuck or overwhelmed or frustrated and give up. 
So lipotoxicity is silent, but it is powerful. It explains why you can look a normal weight and still be dealing with fatty liver, high blood pressure, or even prediabetes. The good news is that you can reverse it. Start today by prioritizing protein, lowering carbs, definitely under 50 grams at least, choosing quality fats, giving your body time to burn stored fat through intermittent fasting, add resistance training, and you've got the blueprint to heal from the inside out. And if you'd like help, download my free lipotoxicity checklist in the description. It'll give you a step-by-step guide to see if it applies to you and how to start to address it. If you're new to uh, keto, I'll also put the link into my Keto Made Simple ebook to get you started. But if you really want to go for deeper guidance, that's what I'm here for as a coach. You don't have to do this alone. Okay. Just let me know in the comments if you're interested in coaching. I'll see you in the next video.